Out to solve the oldest cold case on file, the death of common sense, this is The Daniel Natal Show. John Stuart Mill, in Considerations on Representative Government, talks about the requisite population that a free society requires. He talks about how in a republic, you have an active citizenry. As a result, they all actively participate in law enforcement. They're de facto deputies. So if they see a mugger robbing a woman, they'll actively stop him. In a despotic state, they don't have citizens, but subjects. These subjects will cross to the other side of the street and say, this is the police's responsibility. I shouldn't get involved. Precisely because the citizens in a republic help the police, says Mill, there's no need for a police state. The citizens themselves are an auxiliary force for the police. In a society of passive people, by contrast, you require a large police state because no one lends law enforcement a hand. Mill writes, this question really depends upon a still more fundamental one, namely, which of two common types of character for the general good of humanity it is most desirable should predominate, the active or the passive type, that which struggles against evils or that which endures them, that which bends to circumstances or that which endeavors to make circumstances bend to itself. Mill says of passive people, quote, their moral capacities are stunted, end quote. When they see evil, they don't endeavor to stop it, but to look the other way. Tolerance is their highest value, and tolerance is, of course, a tolerance for evil. Like that quote from Edmund Burke, all it requires for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And this is what our young people are being trained to do. Interestingly, John Stuart Mill talks about the training that people receive in a despotism, namely, to be passive. He talks about how when an active person sees a problem within himself, he seeks to change it. When a passive person sees a problem within himself, he's trained to blame others. This is the secret agenda behind grievance culture. It's less about stirring up antagonisms among different demographic groups than it is about training the youth to be passive. Mill continues, a passive character which yields to obstacles instead of striving to overcome them may not indeed be very useful to others, no more than to itself, but it might be expected to be at least inoffensive. Contentment is always counted among the moral virtues, but it is a complete error to suppose that contentment is necessarily or naturally attendant on passivity of character. And useless it is, the moral consequences are mischievous. Where there exists a desire for advantages not possessed, the mind which does not potentially possess them by means of its own energies is apt to look with hatred and malice on those who do. The person bestirring himself with hopeful prospects to improve his circumstances is the one who feels goodwill towards others engaged in or who have succeeded in the same pursuit. And where the majority are so engaged, those who do not attain the object have had the tone given to their feelings by the general habit of the country and ascribe their failure to one of effort or opportunity or to their personal ill luck. But those who, while desiring what others possess, put no energy into striving for it, are either incessantly grumbling that fortune does not do for them what they would not attempt to do for themselves, or overflowing with envy and ill will towards those who possess what they would like to have. This is the dark truth behind grievance culture. It's the training of the populace to be passive, disengaged, cut off from their own power. The tyrant requires a passive population to operate. An active population would take him out, as Aristotle points out in politics. So it's always in the interest of the tyrant to encourage vice, distractions, passivity. This is why our schools have removed ethics and civics from their curriculum and replaced them with rainbow flags and banners that promote tolerance. But more than that, this is why schools are training kids that they have no rights or individuality, which might lead to individual initiative. To see this training, Look at this video of a school where kids are forbidden to talk to each other while they're in the halls, lest they arrive at opinions that diverge from the party line. Exhibit B is a photo from a school in Georgia. Look at how zombie-like they look, even to the extent of outstretched arms, ostensibly to encourage social distancing, but really to create a new generation of hive mind zombies. The little kids are being trained like these young college students who have undergone conditioning to suppress the evidence of their own eyes and to submit to the gaslighting. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you, okay, like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'd be like, what? <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I would say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, 
I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason need to do that now. If that's where you feel like mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're 6'5". If you truly believed you're 6'5", I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong, like, that's wrong to believe in it, because, I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I can be a Chinese woman. You... <laughs> um, sure. But I can't be a six-foot-five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six-foot-five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you are six foot five, or Chinese, or a woman. What you just witnessed were the yes men from the Hans Christian Andersen fable, The Emperor's New Clothes. These sycophants to power have been psychologically conditioned to suppress their own critical thinking faculties and to look the other way when evil's taking place. What, children are being trafficked? You didn't see anything. These are not the droids you're looking for. Now turn around, stop believing your lying eyes, and embrace the gaslighting. As John Stuart Mill said, such passive people are morally stunted. Our freedoms are under attack, and yet the loss of freedom is not inevitable. America can be saved, and an informed citizenry can and will make the difference. Join us weekly for episodes of Beyond the Cover, and check out our print magazine too at thenewamerican.com.